Okay, so it now gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. Sabrina Schultz obtained her Bachelor of Science in Biology and Linguistics in 2019 at Bielefeld University in Germany and conducted the experiment for her bachelor thesis in Tokyo. In this experiment, she tested whether urban large billed crows can discriminate two spoken languages, the unfamiliar Dutch and the familiar Japanese without prior training. In July 2020, Sabrina passed her Master of Science by Research at Middlesex University. Her thesis focused on individual discrimination of birds using recordings from zebra finches and large-billed crows. Sabrina is now starting her PhD on speech perception in wild urban carrion crows and has recently been appointed the BTO, that's the British Trust for Ornithology Regional Representative for North London. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and pass you over to Sabrina. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to quickly share my screen with you. Okay, and if other people wouldn't mind just switching off your videos, that's great. Thank you. Right, okay. So uh, my talk is about avian eavesdropping on human speech. And to get into that, first of all, we have to cover what is eavesdropping. Eavesdropping refers to um, the use of information and signals by individuals other than the primary target. So um, someone who this information was not intended for. And there's two different kinds of eavesdropping that I'm gonna um, refer to. The first one is social eavesdropping. Social eavesdropping is when there's an, a signal exchange between two individuals and then a third party is listening in on that um, without being addressed. And then the second type is interceptive eavesdropping. And that's when an individual broadcasts its signal to an entire area and everyone within this area can listen in, um, regardless of who it is. Um, an example of that would be a bird sitting in a tree and the bird is sitting there trying to attract a mate and it's singing its song. And then the song is broadcasted to the entire area. So um, potential mates can hear, but also humans who walk by. So that's when you hear bird song. Um, you're basically eavesdropping in on birds <laughs> and um, predators can hear. So everyone in the area. Why would, why would birds ever eavesdrop on us, on the other hand of this um, equation? Um, I'm gonna focus on three different settings where this might be beneficial to them. The first one is when the birds are in captivity and are being hand raised by humans. And in this kind of setting, humans would actually be sort of their social group and be part of their social contacts because they don't have members of their own species around, just humans. A good example of that is when uh, birds start to do speech imitation. And that often happens when birds are being hand raised by people in some species, at least. Um, the famous biologist Conrad Lorenz had a pet raven named Roa, and Roa was able to say his own name in a human intonation, the way that Conrad Lorenz used to say it. Um, there's a lab in France that um, has hand raised a New Caledonian crow. And this crow is able to say uh, some French words, um, some phrases it learned from songs. And um, it also imitates some human sounds like sneezes. Um, there's been a report of an Australian magpie that was able to say the words, go away. <laughs> and uh, European starlings are actually very good at um, imitating human speech. They can say phrases like good morning and such. Another example um, of a setting where eavesdropping might be useful for a bird is to recognize danger. Um, and this depends on the prior experience this bird might have had with humans. So in areas where um, certain bird types like um, crows or pigeons are being considered pests and are in a sense being persecuted, they might consider humans as dangerous um, or they might find particular individuals dangerous uh, crows, for example, can recognize individual faces from humans who have um, tried to capture them in the past. So someone individual who has been dangerous to them. And eavesdropping in on our speech and our conversations might help them um, identify these dangers and recognize that humans are around or that particular people are around. And uh, an experiment that is sort of related to this is um, an experiment on the discrimination between familiar voices and unfamiliar voices in carrion crows. Um, this was done in a lab in Vienna and um, they tested captive crows with the voices of um, women in their lab 
and women who were never in the lab and thus unfamiliar to the crows. And um, what they did was they played the recordings of these voices to the crows, and then they recorded the behaviors of the crows that they displayed when the playback started. So um, whether they would orient their bodies towards the playback speaker or whether they would uh, switch into a vigilance position. Um, and then they compared this, these behaviors um, between the voice categories. And what they found was that um, the birds were more vigilant around unfamiliar voices. And that makes sense because <laughs> um, if you're a crow in a captive environment and you're familiar with certain people in the lab who you know are not a threat to you, you wouldn't need to be vigilant around them. But when you have people who are unfamiliar to you, who you don't know, you don't know how they will react, whether they pose a danger to you, it might pay off to be more vigilant, more careful around them at first until you get to know them. And that's something where eavesdropping gets in useful. The third setting that I'm going to focus on is exploitation. And by that I mean um, when a bird gets a benefit from humans being around. Um, and a very cool example of that is cooperation between honey guides and humans. So this is not actually um, an example of speech per se. It's more of a human-made sound, but it's such a cool <laughs> behavior that I wanted to include it anyways. Um, there are these African honey guides that um, react when humans produce this sort of whistle-like sound. And the whistle sound is just to announce uh, their presence, basically. It could be any other human-made sound. And when the honey guides hear this sound, they approach the humans and then lead them to bee nests. Um, and these bee nests are difficult to find, so um, humans would have more trouble finding these nests without the help of the honey guides. And when they get to the bee nest, the humans open up the nest and take the honey out. And then they leave behind the opened up nest with um, wax inside. And that's what the honey guides eat. And for the honey guides, it's difficult to get into this nest, so they benefit from humans opening this up. So it's a win-win situation. And at this point in the cooperation, when it's already established, it's not really eavesdropping anymore because um, humans are trying to attract honey guides with this whistle. But in the first instance, when they were setting this up, the honey guides would have had to eavesdrop in on humans to perceive these sounds and um, recognize that humans are around to be approached and to find humans to initiate this cooperation. So to start this off, there must have been eavesdropping by honey guides on humans. So these are some examples of the behaviors that are occurring in um, the wild and in captive um, conditions. But you might also want to know what, um, what it is that birds can perceive in speech. Um, the first thing that is come to, comes to mind about um, cues that are in speech are vowels and consonants, just the single sounds that we produce when we speak. Zebra finches are actually able to um, discriminate words when they differ in their vowel. Um, there's been a discrimination experiment with the words sweet and wet, where zebra finches were able to recognize the, uh, the difference between these two words that only differ in their vowels. And similarly, um, Japanese quail have been shown to discriminate words after training, of course, um, when they start with a different consonant. So they were able to discriminate words when they start with a D as opposed to um, B or G. Another thing that's in, in speech that might be perceived by birds or is being perceived by birds um, is syllable stress. Some of you might remember this from poem analysis in high school. Um, when you have a word that it consists of two syllables, for example, and one of the syllables is stressed, um, the, when the first syllable is stressed, that's called a trochaic word. And when the second syllable is stressed, it's iambic. And Bunchies and zebra finches are actually able to um, perceive these differences in words and recognize whether it's um, a trochaic or iambic. So they kind of pick up on this um, stress in words. Um, an example of a difference in, in stress patterns in words would be the words um, permit and permit, where you have different kind of meanings based on whether the first syllable is stressed or the second one. You don't, don't just have the content of the actual sentence in, in speech that gives information. It's also 
emotional prosody and the sort of way that you say what you're saying, what kind of emotion you're conveying just by the tone that you use. Um, for example, when I say the sentence, it's raining today, it's raining today, you can hear that, how I feel about this, just by the way of how I intonate it, other than just the contents of my words. And Java sparrows are actually able to pick up on this. So they can perceive when um, sentences are spoken in either admiration or suspicion. And once they've learned these kind of patterns and can recognize these in learned sentences, they can also generalize it to new sentences they've never heard before. And the last thing I'm going to focus on is speech rhythm. And that's sort of the melody, melody that you have when you talk. Um, that goes over the entire sentence and not over every sentence that you produce. And that is um, typical of the language that you speak. And broadly, um, languages can be classified into different kinds of rhythmic classes based on what kind of rhythmic patterns they use. And this is not necessarily a 100% fit. So some languages mostly lean towards one, but partly fit into others too. But it's more of a Get, get an idea kind of thing. Um, so for example, French and Chinese would be considered syllable stressed, and then Dutch and English would be considered stress timed, and Japanese would be called moral timed. Um, so when you think about French and English sentences, they have a sort of different melody to them, the kind of way that people talk when they speak French and English differs just in the melody they use. And because that's also a prosody, Java sparrows can also um, discriminate different languages, presumably because it's prosody. Um, they've been trained to discriminate between Chinese and English sentences. Um, and in this sort of training, you have to kind of imagine because you can't just ask a bird <laughs> which language it is, um, you have to kind of train it to give its answer by its behavior. Um, and what they did was they had two different perches in the cage with the uh, Java sparrows. And uh, the first perch was the ready perch, which is when the bird goes onto this perch, um, they start playing the recordings of speech. And when the bird wants to answer what it is essentially and get a reward for getting it right, it goes into the, uh, the response perch. Um, so for example, if you have a Java sparrow in the Chinese group and it sits on the ready perch, and then it starts playing Chinese, the Java sparrow would go to um, the response perch and get a reward. But if English is playing, um, that would be the wrong language because it's in the Chinese group. And then if it still goes to the response perch and decides incorrectly, essentially, the cage lights would turn off to show the bird this was wrong. There is no reward for you, next trial. And this is essentially the kind of experiment we did with um, the large bird crows. Um, but instead of training them, we just watched what they did when they heard, when they heard the um, speech recordings for the first time without any sort of reinforcement or training or anything that would alter their behavior. It was just what they felt like doing. So we had these um, seven wild caught crows and the crows were caught in Tokyo because um, the Tokyo government is sort of um, implementing this um, crow control program because they have so many crows that they're um, catching them in the wild and then removing them. And some of these crows end up in the lab. And um, with these crows, we did the playback experiment. So we played um, different kinds of sentences in either Dutch or Japanese, and then watch what they did. And to remind you, the Dutch is in a different kind of rhythmic class than Japanese. So these are different kinds of prosody types, essentially. The first response behavior that we looked for when we were looking at um, their behavior was head level. Um, and this is sort of a proxy for vigilance because when you imagine a bird being watchful and being attentive, it wouldn't be looking down and looking down on the ground, it would be looking up. So at least with like a level head like this and looking around and being watchful. So this is the, the setup that we had. This is the aviary where we did the experiment. And um, here we have a crow that will be tested with us. And here the kind of red line indicates um, where you imagine the head level basically. And then when you put a line on the head of the crow, 
can see that this is above head level. So this would be considered responsive. The other behavior that we looked for was time spent next to the speaker. And this is sort of um, an indication of curiosity in the bird. Um, we're imagining that if it approaches the speaker um, and it kind of investigates what it is, what is producing the sound, what's going on, that would be another sign of being responsive to the playback. So when you look again at um, the aviary, um, you kind of imagine this kind of boundary where the red line is, and then the yellow lines indicate where we would consider the listening area. So when the bird is in this area, because the speaker is actually right next um, to, to the aviary in the right-hand corner. So when the bird is sitting in this yellow area, it would be considered attentive to um, the playback. And then we played them um, 10 sentences at a time. And then we calculated the relative, re relative response time per 10 seconds. Uh, and that's because you know how sentences are never really the same length between each sentence. You can't make a sentence the exact same length for all sentences. So to kind of make um, a good comparison between trials, we calculated this sort of relative response time. So for, for each 10 seconds, how many seconds did the bird do this behavior? For how many seconds of the 10 seconds per trial did they engage in the active behavior? And this is what we found. <laughs> So the way to read this is that um, on the left, you have all the data for the Dutch trials. And on the right, you have all the data for the Japanese trials. And um, the, the black bars in the middle, they're the median of um, the data. So the median time um, the crows engaged in this behavior out of the 10 seconds relatively. And already from... Um, from looking at this, you can already see that the, the median bar is a lot higher for Dutch than for Japanese. Um, it's almost at six seconds for Dutch and for Japanese it's more like four seconds. So the crows were essentially spending on average almost two seconds more for Dutch than for Japanese in the responsive behavior. Um, and when you look at individual crows in our group, because individuals define their behavior, these are the five crows that were being really reactive to the playback. So you have again um, the Dutch stimuli on the left and then the Japanese on the right. And you can see for all of these in the yellow, in the green frames, that um, the left one, the Dutch one, is a lot higher than the right one. So they're being a lot more responsive to the Dutch than the Japanese. The only two that are not doing this <laughs> are these two because there's always one crow or two that's ruining it for everybody. <laughs> These two are actually uh, juvenile crows. So they are only two and three years old and they have a lot less time being exposed to language or speech in general. Um, and we're assuming that that's um, because that that's why um, they were doing um, less of this behavioral pattern than the rest. The rest is um, four years old, so they're adults. So what do we get from this kind of data? What do we learn from it? Well, first of all, because we didn't train them and we didn't reinforce any behavior or motivate them in any way, um, we can assume that they were already familiar with Japanese because they were so much more reactive to the other language, Dutch. Um, and there's no other kind of reason for them to behave like this. Um, and the second thing is that because we didn't train them or reward them, we have to assume that they were being listened, that they were being attentive or were listening beforehand out of their own motivation. So we're kind of imagining that um, the crows were eavesdropping on human speech way before the experiment, way before I <laughs> even came to Tokyo, and um, were already learning these sort of patterns that characterize Japanese. And by the time we were doing the experiment, they were so familiar with it and so habituated to the cues that make up Japanese, that they didn't feel the need to react anymore. But the Dutch, on the other hand, was so unfamiliar that that still got them to react a lot more. And that makes you wonder why they would do this. <laughs> why 
why would they care? Why would they even listen to us? What's what's in it for them? You wouldn't think that crows would do anything if there's not a benefit to it. Um, and the theory we have, the hypothesis that we developed is that um, because the crows were being um, were previously living in Tokyo in a very urbanized city um, and were then wild caught from this very urban area, um, they had so much exposure to humans all the time that they um, learned during the time in the wild, essentially, while they were living in the city. And the other thing is that, um, as I mentioned before, um, crows are being somewhat persecuted in Tokyo because they're being captured by the government and being removed um, from, from the city, essentially. So it would be fair enough for them to be wary around humans and kind of pay attention to them and be watchful of what they're doing, wanting to be aware when humans are around, just to make sure that they're not being captured by one. So if you remember from the beginning, the um, reasons why birds might eavesdrop on humans, one of them was danger. So this might be an explanation why the crows are behaving in this way. And that's where um, my current work with my PhD starts in, where further, further work will be going. Um, I'm going to be working with wild carrying crows here in London and trying to replicate this experiment again with them and see whether, whether they react to speech. And um, the main things I'm looking for here are, for example, whether there's a difference between species. So um, is it just the large bird crows who care? Or is it all crows? Um, are carrying crows interested? Are they able to perceive these sort of cues to learn? The other thing is a um, difference between cities. Um, is it just because Tokyo is so densely populated? Um, or is it because um, Tokyo is such a monolingual country, uh, city, and Japan is such a monolingual country? Um, in Japan, um, about 98% of the residents are Japanese, and um, in Tokyo it's about 97%. Uh, in London, it's 77 so it's a lot less people who um, speak the same language here than they do in Tokyo or Japan. So there might be a difference between cities already. And a third thing that might be relevant is human behavior. So how we engage with wildlife, how we behave around them. There's been some previous work on how um, the behavior of residents engaging with birds is um, influencing their behavior. So there was this experiment with um, comparison between Seattle and Berlin. Um, where in rural areas in Seattle, crows and starlings were being um, kind of discouraged from coming, coming around <laughs> to the house essentially, and um, were being shot and were being um, chased away more often than in rural areas around Berlin. And um, in this comparison, they found that um, the crows and starlings were also more wary of humans in Seattle than they were in Berlin. So where they were being actively discouraged, they were also more worried around, worried about, more wary about human presence and were being more cautious around humans. So this shows that birds do perceive how we treat them and how we behave towards them, whether we want, whether we encourage their presence or not, and then adjust their behavior accordingly. And then my last point, <laughs> why is this important? Why should we care about eavesdropping birds? What, do, what does it matter? Well, the first point is um, if we start to study how birds perceive us and how birds see us, how they are influenced by our, our behavior towards them, we might improve our behavior towards them and increase our, our um, appreciation towards them. Crows are mostly unpopular species in many, many cities and many um, areas in the Western world. Um, similar like uh, similar to gulls and pigeons and um, if we show that um, they are so sentient and so responsive to our behavior maybe we can <laughs> show a little bit more appreciation towards them and the second point is that the world is increasingly urbanized more and more people are living in the city more and more people are living um, close to the city cities are expanding on wider areas every year and birds and other animals will have to adjust to this life. 
Um, many are already living in cities, but more and more will have to find a way to um, deal with human presence. And some animals like crows or um, gulls and pigeons or foxes in London, um, they're doing really well with human contact and they're doing fine as it is, but other species not so well. So they would need a little bit, a little bit more help um, dealing with our presence. And if we figure out why crows are doing so well in the city, why, why they can deal with our presence, we might actually be able to actively support those species who don't. So that hopefully at some point in the future, we can all coexist happily in the city together. Thank you for your attention. Myself. There, thank you very much for that, Sabrina. That was a really great introduction. And I can see that there's actually quite a lot of questions coming through. We've got plenty of time to explore some of these ideas, maybe in a bit more depth. If so, if you're if you're kind of happy with that. I saw at the beginning there were there were quite a few people talking about their own experiences of where they've, you know, kind of got pet birds and talking about the, the kinds of ways that um, pet birds seem to be reacting to them, um, picking up on some of your kind of earlier ideas. So, uh, Anka, are you, are you kind of OK to start maybe with some of those kind of thoughts at the beginning? Yeah, I was just going to, I mean, just kind of say that people were commenting about, um, for instance, um, there's one woman who said that she was really surprised about starlings being able to talk, you know, as was I, actually. <laughs> Um, and, you know, that um, also there were some comments about how people um, were um, kind of, um, let's see, I'm just trying to find some of these comments now, um, where one woman said that she used to um, play with her friend's parrot by saying good bird in a frightened way, and he would mock threaten her. <laughs> um, someone else said that um, her budgies will react with worry or curiosity, depending on how I pronounce their names. Sounds a lot like children. Mm. You know, if I proper name my daughter, she's a little bit more worried than if I go by her nickname. So, yeah, you know, they're, they're quite similar. And somebody actually did say, make some comment about how they were like children. <laughs> um, so... Now, I'm just going to go through, I'm just going to go, since we have some time, I'm just going to start with the um, first question, which is, um, do you think that crows know or recognize that the different speech is human or another animal? It would be interesting to compare this with the sounds of other animals mimicking human voices. Yeah, definitely a good question. Um, that's actually one of other theories I'm exploring um, going forward. Um, with the crows in Tokyo or in Japan in general, you would imagine that because they've ever only heard um, Japanese, they wouldn't really be able to recognize any other language that sounds very different um, from that as human, um, because they would never have learned any other sort of sound from humans. Um, but it might be that crows who live in more multicultural areas, um, such as London, um, that they would be more flexible in their perception of um, human speech or what typical humans sound like, because they hear so many different languages um, all the time, especially in the city centre where there's also lots of tourists. Um, these might be more flexible in their perception than crows in Tokyo. And this kind of sort of related, you know, um, did you, well, some, um, Annie has said really interesting. Um, and then she said, did you include any kind of control, um, for example, non-human noise and test response in these, experien in these experiments? No, not, not in this one. Um, before the experiment, we did um, a pilot run, um, a few pilot trials, where we tested the behaviors um, to just um, single sounds, um, like a high-pitched beep or low-pitched beep. Um, but other than that, we um, didn't have a control in this one. I work going forward. Um, I'm planning on um, adding a control in the sense that it will include the sounds of an animal that they would um, usually hear around here that is not human, and um, the sound of an animal who they would probably not have heard before. 
but are not commonly found in London um, as a sort of control. Thank you. Can I can I just, uh, just say if anybody would like to ask a question in person, that is possible as well, because we have a little bit of time. So if you want to just you know, pop your virtual hand up, then you, it would be possible for you to you know, talk to Sabrina directly as well. But ca we'll carry on uh, and because um, I know we've got a lot. We've already got a lot of questions in the chat to go through as well. But that is an option for people. And we do. Yeah, there's quite a few interesting ones. I'm going to stick. There's one on statistics, but I'm going to stick that one at the very end. Um, but this one actually is quite an interesting one um, from Lauren Leffer. Did you have to avoid speaking around the crows when you were setting up and conducting these, these experiments or trials? Yeah, you can't uh, speak around them. Um, we actually did it this way that um, the aviary was outside um, and I just put the speaker next to it and put a camera up instead of watching it myself and then went back inside so they wouldn't even see me while while I was doing the experiment um, to really make sure that they um, would not be confused by by seeing me because it might also be possible that um, when they only hear speech um, and they have no other visual cues um, that they would focus more on the speech but when they see a person they would rank the visual cues above the acoustic cues. We don't know that. Um, so to make sure that they don't have any visual cues of humans around whatsoever, um, I went back inside. With the wild um, experiments I'm planning now, this wouldn't really be possible. Um, but in that case, I would have to watch from distance to make sure that they don't think I'm involved in anything. Right. <laughs> um, okay, we've got from Rachel. I know there was a study on starlings where if kept in a house with humans talking around them, they learn human speech. But when just played recordings, they don't mimic the speech, although sometimes they learn the um, sound of the tape recorder turning off and on. So it seems a little bit different to your crows then. Yeah, um, with the speech imitation, um, social um, aspects seem to be relevant as well. Um, so when you, when you have a recorder, you don't really have the um, social influence that you would have when you have an actual person talking to the bird. And um, in the case of captive hand-raised um, birds, they would probably have a sort of relationship with this person actually, so they would know the person and um, this added social effect um, might might influence um, the, the learning motivation possibly. But with the crows, we didn't have any sort of speech imitation or social situation. So this was just um, perceptional essentially. Um, a question, with time, did the Japanese crows change their response to researchers during their period of being caged? Good question. I don't know. <laughs> um, I wasn't around when they were being uh, caught, uh, so the crows had been in the lab for a while. Um, to my knowledge, the people in the lab were also sort of social with the crows. Um, so when they went inside the lab, for example, they would greet the crows and just say hello. Um, but other than that, um, I have no knowledge of <laughs> any sort of experience with that. Um, so, okay, this one's quite an interesting question um, from Anne Tang, who's asked, has anyone compared the ability to distinguish vowels and consonants between birds with different levels of song complication? The cedar waxwing, for instance, has a simple vocalization. I'm guessing they might not detect the intricacies of vowels and consonants at the same level as other more vocal birds, such as the brown thrasher. Mm. Yeah, this sort of um, work usually focuses on, on songbirds for this exact reason, because um, songbirds are vocal learners. Um, and because they have this sort of extra perceptual ability, essentially, to um, learn their song, um, they are also more um, more attentive to other sort of sounds that we might produce and um, that's why the focus of this sort of research is usually on uh, songbirds um, for this exact reason, yeah. I'm going to bring, so, sorry. sorry, I'm going to, can I just bring in somebody to ask a question in person, if that's all right, Anka? Yeah, Next, is that okay? So, Tony, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. 
Thanks. For that. Actually, Sabrina, sorry, it, <laughs> it was actually the question you've just answered, but in a different way, which was really trying to um, think about the way that birds are perceiving sounds, um, particularly the smaller birds, they're very fast song, song cycles. Um, that granularity of, of understanding or perception of sound and how far we've gone to looking at that, whether that has an impact on being able to discriminate between different sound patterns, different vocalizations with other humans or other animals. Because the other thing, of course, is recognizing other birds' threat calls and alarm calls being a very important aspect there. And they can be in a very different register, which they wouldn't normally encounter. I mean, has there been any work on also looking at the physiological response, perhaps looking at encephalograms and so on to see whether they actually respond differently? Sorry, um, lots of questions there in one hit. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tony. <laughs> Um, well, there's been a lot of work with um, eavesdropping on alarm calls, as you mentioned, um, between birds. And um, it, the interesting thing about eavesdropping on alarm calls is actually that they don't necessarily have to be um, the eavesdropping birds don't have to be um, songbirds at all. So when when there's eavesdropping on other birds, um, it doesn't have to be this vocally advanced um, for some reason. Um, What's the other question again? Sorry, was <laughs> a bit slow to unmute there. No, the other was basically looking at the the, the response. I mean, that just because a bird responds to something, mm. is this this link between hearing responding? So you might see a spike in an encephalogram, for example. There's actually a reaction. So there is a perception that something is happening and how that's being processed, and whether birds consciously acclimate very quickly or consciously acclimate, they acclimate quickly, whether they consciously respond or consciously ignoring. And so sort of subtleties of, of difference, and that takes me back. I was going to talk about the stats later, but I'll, I'll leave it till later. But there's that interesting point about um, the juvenile birds being different in two ways, not just they didn't respond differently, but also they listened more, didn't they? That seems to be what you were showing, which was quite interesting to see. What were they doing? Why were they spending so much time listening as opposed to being attentive? Whereas the other birds were just saying, oh, I'm not interested. It's, it's humans. Let's go. Forget about that. Well, it's actually the other way around. It was um, the adults who were paying more attention um, than the juveniles. But you mentioned um, an interesting thing because um, these behaviours are a good proxy to um, test whether birds are being attentive. But technically, they could be listening and being attentive without um, showing these behaviours. Um, that's something you wouldn't really pick up on on these um, observational studies. Um, but you would be able to do this with, um, for example, stress monitoring. Um, where you measure the, the heart rate of the bird, for example, or the breathing rate is um, often used. Um, so these kind of tests would be more accurate, but they would also put more strain on the bird, possibly just because of the experiment, because um, with observational work, you kind of leave the bird alone and let it just do its thing. Um, so that's a benefit in itself, but yeah, there's some, some listening. With, it, with some of these much smaller physiological measurements, we can, they can be almost indwelling or perhaps on the surface. They don't disturb the bird too much. They can be a really good way of continuously monitoring. So you get large amounts of data, which you can then data trawl later on to actually look at responses, not ju just to, to the sound of the voice, but maybe the quality of the speaker or, or the, 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 the ambience of what's actually happening at any one time. So many factors. I, 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 I don't envy you having to power up go through that kind of data it's quite difficult to, to process i suspect yeah <laughs> thanks tony anchor back to you anchor are you this i yeah. see there's a lot more coming through the chat <laughs> um so from gerhard schneider um regarding your interpretation since these crows were caught presumably by japanese speakers shouldn't they be more attentive to japanese um, to the Japanese, if that means the crow worries about the speaker, whilst they did not have any exposure to Dutch speakers. So simply um, would curiosity about the un unknown be a better explanation than fear? Um, yeah, possibly. Um, the explanation that I think is most likely in this case, and this is all just assumptions at this point because we don't really know the internal thoughts of a bird, um, and there's not been enough studies on this, but um, my thoughts on this are that there are essentially three levels of being attentive for, for this kind of experiment. And um, that the crows are being attentive to both 
languages um, will be paying attention because they had possibly bad experiences with um, Japanese speakers. If the people who were being um, who were working in this capturing program were talking while they were capturing the crows, um, but they might rank the Dutch as unfamiliar more higher um, because they don't know at all what's happening. Um, so it might be that, that they're more attentive to Japanese than to nothing, but more attentive to Dutch than to Japanese. Um, but essentially being attentive to both. It's just that the Dutch is a little bit more, um, and that might be because they don't know what Dutch is and they don't know what's going on. Um, <laughs> and that essentially the danger of, of human contact with uh, Japanese speakers would just be the motivation for them to um, eavesdrop in on the first place and uh, to start listening in the first place. And then they would uh, presumably adjust their behavior um, depending on what they conclude from their eavesdropping. Is this dangerous or not? Maybe, maybe not. Um, so, um, Claudia Vasha says, um, do you think the crows could also discriminate languages from the same linguistic category, for example, Dutch and English? Good question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a point we don't know. Um, there's been some previous work on language discrimination in uh, babies and monkeys and rats. And uh, in previous studies, they found that um, the animals tested were not able to um, discriminate languages from the same class and just from different classes. But we don't know whether the crows would be um, more attentive to details um, that were still being perceived between languages. Um, one possibility, for example, is that um, if you remember how, how zebra finches were, for example, able to um, discriminate between vowels and consonants, it might be that crows um, also perceive individual sounds and um, not all languages use the same sounds. Um, sounds differ between languages and they overlap in part, but some languages use sounds, others don't. So if you were to compare these two languages, and um, if the crows are attentive to individual sounds, they might notice that these sounds are unfamiliar rather than the entire language, but still perceive a difference. That's possible, but that's something um, that has still to be explored. So <laughs> it's just guessing at this point. <laughs> An interesting experiment, actually. <laughs> Um, and Co, I've got another question to ask in per somebody to ask in person, if that's all right. Sorry, I'm going to jump in a bit. Um, I'm just going to ask Dan if you want to unmute yourself. Yeah, hello. If you'd like to ask now. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, really interesting talk. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that there's uh, work on contact calls and uh, alarm calls and sort of uh, heterospecific responses to those. I wonder if. Are you thinking that the that, that what's going on in this phenomenon is related? Because of course, hu human speech is a long sequential thing, whereas contact calls and alarm calls are often isolated uh, events. Do you think that's the same mechanism, or are you thinking of it as a completely different phenomenon? Um, I think it would be the same mechanism. Yeah, um, I think um, for the sheer ability to be able to perceive these. Um, acoustic cues in sounds that are not from your own species, um, the perceptional ability should be the same, even if um, the length of the vocalization is different. Um, so yeah, I do think that has uh, the same mechanism, essentially. Oh, if I, because I'm wondering with, with speech, the, a lot of it is about the sequencing, you know, as opposed to an individual acoustic uh, unit. So I'm wondering if the distinction you know, with, with a single alarm call, it's not about the sequencing. That's true, but um, the sequence is mostly important for us because we get this sort of information from the sequence, but that doesn't mean that the crows care about that that much. Um, yeah. It might be that they just hear, oh, human, and then they're done with it. <laughs> but um, at this point, I don't really know. This is a very early, um, very early direction to take with this, so there's so many question marks left. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Dan. If back to you, Anki. If you've got some, do you want to oh, choose? There's more. <laughs> there's lots more. I'll see if I, how many I can get through. Yeah. Um, just, I mean, this is more of a personal question. Um, so Rebecca Sanders um, said, you know, what inspired you? Let's see. I think there was, you know, what inspired you to look into this work? It's such an interesting area of research. I'd never thought of, of looking into it before. So, what was your inspiration? 
Well, um, I, as an undergrad, I studied uh, both linguistics and biology, which is sort of a weird combination. Um, but I was really interested in how um, languages work. And to do this and to kind of get beyond what humans get of language, I wanted to have a look at what, um, what animals perceive in language and how make these comparisons. And when I started to look around in this, there's a whole world out there doing exactly this and this kind of research. And that's where I kind of got into it. And I found these um, experiments with um, monkeys and rats doing language discrimination. I thought, oh, well, that's so cool. I want to do this with birds. I bet no one has done this with birds before. And then I dug a little deeper and found out that birds are actually one of the most <laughs> used organism to study languages. And I was like, oh, well, not that novel anymore, but um, still interesting. So then I tried to find um, a lab that would let me do this experiment because we didn't have um, the necessary setup um, where I was studying. So I asked around and um, Professor Isawa was actually the, the person who agreed to do this and was keen to um, do the experiment with me. And she happened to have crows and I thought, oh, well, crows are cool. Why not? <laughs> so I just kind of tumbled into this. And um, yeah, as it turns out, crows are the perfect bird for doing this. So I was very lucky about this. <laughs> Well, that's actually, I think a lot of PhD research is more people kind of tumbling into something and, you know, you start off with one bit of research and then it just leads into something completely different, but you know, yeah. interesting. <laughs> and I mean, here's a question as well. Are, are we any closer to understanding exactly what birds are saying beyond alarm ca calls and songs? Well, I think we're getting closer in, in small steps. It's a very complicated uh, thing, but there are definitely um, advances. Um, there's uh, some research being done that I think is really cool that I haven't really gotten into yet, but um, there's some research in Japan where it is thing where the birds have syntax of their own. So like um, sort of grammar-like structure in the songs because songs um, have these tiny little pieces, essentially little um, parts and um, some birds at least seem to be conveying meaning in the way that they arrange these little parts, similar to human grammar. So that's um, something that's very new, I think, and very um, innovative. Um, that might lead to a lot more um, discoveries. So we've learned a lot, but there's still so much more to, to find out. <laughs> So we're going to try to figure out exactly what crows are saying when they're kind of hovering nearby and chatting about us, because you know they're going to take over. Um, now, here's an interesting question, because in St. James's Park and other um, parks around London and around the world, of course, we have lots of tourists there feeding the birds and the squirrels. Um, and so Emma Knowles wants to know, do you think the birds in St. James's Park learn which nationalities of tourists are the most likely to feed them? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, if there was um, a particular tourist group that would um, feed them more, probably. Um, I think in London, um, bird feeders and bird fans come from all over the place, so um, there wouldn't be one group doing this, but in, in theory, probably, yeah. <laughs> So I've got a question about a budgie. Mm -hmm. I had a budgie, said Joanne Mad Maddox, um, with a vocabulary of 40 plus words, two human voices, and when a stranger entered the room, the bird would repeat the question, who is it? Over and over until it got an answer. <laughs> Upon getting the answer, he would reply, oh, and then continue with its day, his day. Is this unusual for a budgie? Oh, um, to be honest, budgies are not my, my main <laughs> specialty. Um, I just have like some, some pieces of information about budgies from um, general language experiments, but um, this sounds unusual to me at least. Um, I bet um, budgie people would know more about this, but um, it does sound very interesting and very unusual, yes. So we've got a, um, a question from somebody in Michigan Kibashi, or some, um, I just got us, I think, a surname. There, there's a famous murder case here in Michigan where an African gray parrot kept saying, don't boop, 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 um, shoot. Um, after the husband was murdered, wife was eventually convicted. 
Have you done any experiments on if birds pick up sounds more easily if they're yelled um, versus the same words said sweetly? Oh, good question. Uh, <laughs> um, I haven't actually, but um, there is uh, anecdotal reports about something like this. So um, for example, Conrad Lorenz who had um, the pet raven, he also had um, a crow in his house and the crow be um, flying around all the time and then went missing for a few weeks. And um, when it eventually got back, it apparently repeated the phrase um, that the, essentially when, when it left, um, it got captured somewhere in, in Germany and um, then managed its way out of the trap. And when it got back to Conrad Lorenz, it repeated the sentence that its capture essentially said, um, which was something along the lines of got it in my trap or something. Um, these sort of intense moments might be more memorable, um, similar to how it's more memorable for us. Um, the birds find this more um, noteworthy, possibly. Mm. But at this point, it's just um, anecdotal and no real experiment, to my knowledge at least. And sorry, we've got um... yeah, we've got time for maybe just one or two quick questions to finish off with Anka. So if we've got okay, there's um, is there any work you've come across about avian perception of truthfulness uh, or deception in human speech? Um, if they can parse emotional intonation, and they can, in some cases, deliberately lie, like Alex allegedly, can they tell when a human is lying? Oh, good question. Ooh, um, maybe. Um, I'm thinking that um, for the Java sparrows who were able to perceive um, the difference between admiration and suspicion in the emotional prosody, if someone is a bad liar and they're being very nervous about it, Maybe they're picking up on this. <laughs> um, for a good liar, um, who we wouldn't notice either, I, I'm not sure whether they would perceive that too. But if there's any sort of indication in emotional prosody, they should probably be able to um, perceive it, yeah. That'd be quite <laughs> little lie detectors. Yeah. Um, well, there's two questions. Um, one, um, can any birds form speech independently or are they only mimicking? Um, I think they're only mimicking. I think, um, especially if you have a social connection to the person who they're being, um, being close to and um, they're imitating a particular person um, who, who they're close to, um, it's probably just um, communication between these two people or the person and the crow in this in the sense of the person and the bird. Um, I'm not sure whether it's even directed at anyone else outside of this social situation um, because they probably don't really know what it, what these meanings, what, what it means what they're saying. I think they're just um, repeating what they heard um, this important person say. Right. And then the last, I think probably this might be the last so question. The last one, um, yeah. Um, so Mike Talbot was asking, what should we read for more on this? Um, do you have a website? Do you have articles? Are there good books? Um, any information? I do have articles. Um, I've got um, the paper that I, I presented uh, briefly here um, in more detail. Um, and my other work with uh, human perception of individual birds, uh, which is sort of the other way around, um, how humans can perceive individuality just in birdsong. Um, if you really want to go deeper into this whole thing, um, there's um, lots of papers from the university in uh, Vienna and uh, Leiden. And there's a great book I have on my bookshelf, <laughs> actually. It's called uh, The Evolution of Language um, by Fitch. And it's covering the whole, um, this whole topic very, very um, extensively. So there's something that might be interesting if you're really into this sort of subject. 
Okay, thank you ever so much, Sabrina. That was really fascinating. Are there, I don't, did you say people could get in touch with you in some way or the other? Because I, I've seen we've not answered some of the questions, particularly the statistics and the p-value one. So is there some way that people could just kind of like ask those questions of you at some other point? Yeah, definitely. Um, I am on Twitter, so that's um, if you have that, you can contact me there. Um, also got a profile on ResearchGate. Um, and you should be able to contact me through this website and also find uh, my papers on ResearchGate. That's great. Thank you very much. So please, anybody that didn't get your question ans answered, and I know there were, there, you know, there were several, now please get in touch with Sabrina. That's great.